welcome to the Business of Business podcast. In this episode, Lewis speaks to Rajesh Partha Sarathi, founder and CEO of Mentis. We talk about the challenges with data protection and avoiding the impacts of data theft and loss. But how adept are organizations at understanding what data they have to begin with? Enjoy. My name is uh, Rajesh Partha Sarathi. I'm a chartered accountant from India. And I moved to the United States in 1998 to um, implement Oracle Lead Business Suite at uh, some customers. Um, and um, since I have an audit background, I realized that um, an Oracle ERP type applications, how difficult it would be for a traditional auditor to, uh, to be able to um, get good a sense of what the controls are and how to keep their keep their warm and fuzzies around um, being able to audit a system that is running on some complex application like Oracle ERP. Okay. My audit day started off when we were just doing manual accounts and then auditing manual accounts. So the controls were kind of easy and straightforward to manage. Um, but as we started getting into larger and larger, more and more complex interconnected systems, our reliance on um, controls became more uh, and especially the controls that were invisible. Yeah. So I, um, so at that point in time, I decided that I needed to build some uh, software to help auditors manage uh, Oracle ERP and the controls. And I joined a company called Tickmark at that point of time. Uh, and Tickmark had a software called um, Setup Reporter, which would document all of the key uh, key configurations within Oracle ERP uh, and also do some uh, trigger-based uh, alerting around any changes to uh, key controls. Okay. So I joined that company primarily to think that uh, I could bring something to the table um, in the, from an audit and technology ERP standpoint. And for them, I designed, I ideated, designed, built some software, which through a series of acquisitions are now Oracle's GRC's product line, um, including the, the transaction and the, and the access control pieces for all my designs. Uh, I built that, um, and, and then in 2004, um, I decided that uh, maybe the next way would be um, access to information, right? So yeah. some some of the, through my years working with uh, developers to build uh, technology solutions, uh, I realized that sometimes developers have access to way too much data. Uh, just from my exposure, what I could tell was um, I'm a chart accountant. So I understand accounts. I understand how um, how a trial balance works. And even before the results are posted or available to the public, I can just run a query against the trial balance and figure out if the company that I'm implementing Oracle ERP is, is whether they're going to be profitable or not, whether they're going to be able to match their numbers or not. Yeah. So the type of information that is available to me, even though there's like significant access control in the application layer and only certain people can see appropriate transactions and all that, as a developer or as a DBA, as someone that has access to the four tables, I had access to so much information. So... I decided that our next wave is going to be uh, restricting access to sensitive information, whatever that uh, sensitive information is, whatever that umbrella falls under, restricting access to that from an internal standpoint, right? Like uh, uh, privilege access to DBAs and developers, not letting them get too much access. So I started Mentis in 2004 with my first application being uh, a product called Istanbul, where we built some uh, manual data classifications. We set uh, for all people have our national identifier social security number. Um, we built all of that data classifications and we created a product called iScramble, which would scramble data in non-production Oracle ERP databases while keeping the database fundamentally useful for all IT purposes, but remove sensitive data like names, addresses, social yeah. security numbers, things like that. And th this was um, back and in, that was in 2004, right? So that was long yeah. before... Uh, yeah, GDPR and started, yeah. yeah, and um, and so uh, going back to 2004, then because I imagine, I imagine certainly the market was very different back then. Like I say, there was no GDPR. Was it, was it a hard sell? Because I, I I remember going back to 2004, everybody was focused on endpoints, you know, like firewalls yeah. and that kind of thing, and not and and you know, the saying is if you protect the data, everything else is kind of you know. Not by the by, but if you protect the data first and foremost, that's you know the most important thing. Um, and here you were in 2004 looking at that. But I just remember at that time, everybody was still focused on endpoints and, and networks and that kind of thing. And there really wasn't anything about data 
So, so what was that like going back to 2004? So here I am, I quit my job, um, and then I said, I'm going to build this new software because um, I think this is the next wave. Uh, and I do some um, early work. Um, so I, I got a little bit of, um, um, I cash in my 401k, and I got a little bit of uh, friends and family type loans. And I started this progress, and I also had a customer, um, which is an audit firm, and I built for them uh, this um, audit software that they could run separation of duties reviews remotely across all of their customers, right? It was, yeah. a, it was an engineering marvel. Um, and that kind of gave me a little bit of cash. So then I started building this, uh, building the software and I went to my first conference. I went to an ISACA conference in Nashville, Tennessee in 2004, I think it was September. Yeah. We got all these nice shirts made and we got these data sheets printed. Uh, and we go in there and I'm, talk, I'm thinking, I'm talking to the exact right audience. This is <laughs> ISACA, they, that's everybody here is a security practitioner. So let me go ahead and tell them how to uh, scramble data on non-production databases and keep it live and active and all this good stuff, right? Yeah. Every single person that I got talked to there was completely deer in the headlights. They had no idea what I was talking about. Right. They all said, but we have firewalls. <laughs> so the problem I was trying to solve and where their understanding was, was completely in way, completely different galaxies. They were not even different planets. They were totally different universes. It didn't even correspond. So what I realized was maybe I'm a little bit ahead of the curve. What I did not understand is how far ahead of the curve I was. Uh, so then I went back to just going to direct IT teams uh, and talking to people that were in the forefront who were trying to do things um, at, the, at the cutting edge. And I also realized at that point of time is most organizations, when I, got, I went to them in 2004 and 2005 and told them that I can solve this problem for them, they were more or less dealing with, hey, my post process, general post process is taking 24 hours. Uh, any reports that I'm running take six hours. I'm dealing with performance problems. Whatever you're talking about is not important. Yeah. It, it really was not anything that they were concerned about. So the my sweet spot became organizations that had people that had been in the organization for multiple years. I had a random number. I had a seven-year threshold. If somebody had been in the organization for more than seven years and they want to do the right thing to protect the, uh, the data of their uh, colleagues as well as their customers, they were my customers. They were the only people that would even engage in a conversation like this. So my early customers were all early, adopt, early adopters that wanted to do the right thing. Yeah, And they also did not want any publicity. They didn't want me to go out and talk, start talking about company X or doing this type of data protection. So it, yeah. was a, it was a very interesting startup point for me at the beginning years of uh, coming up with a solution. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you still get people say the same, you know, you said um, when you went to the conference, people said, well, we have, uh, we have, we have firewalls. Do you still get that today? Well, I, I avoided going to security conferences. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, we started going to more of the, the deeper technology conferences, like the Oracle Human Resources User Groups. Um, I was started going to Oracle Open World, yeah. where you can actually talk to people that are working with the data and have somehow seen that they have access to too much information. Yeah. Um, so we started connecting with people that actually had some skin in the game and actually wanted to do something because they were noticing that there was this uh, massive loophole. Yeah. One of my early customers also, the reason that they um, licensed our software, and they're still a customer, they've been a customer now for like, I think, 12 years, um, was because they were starting an outsourcing project and they were getting, they were sending data to India to be worked on, right, from a development standpoint. Yeah. When the CIO realized that his mother's maiden name and mother's social security number, mother's contact information was now accessible to somebody sitting in India, it became personal, it became immediate. So then they they realize that they have to do this, right? Yeah. So that personal yeah. connection, especially for HR data and benefits data for um, contacts, for um, anybody that you add as a beneficiary, that started opening the eyes of a lot of people in the early days. Yeah. Nowadays, it's not that much anymore. Nowadays, people come to us because they already are aware of a problem, they're already trying to solve it. Now they're coming for more sophisticated solutions that can solve some deep, seeded problems in the architectures of the enterprise applications. Yeah. So we are not in the, we're not in the education space anymore. Um, we are, we're not dealing with early adopters anymore. We're dealing with people that are already deep in the path and they run into roadblocks of uh, 
why their own scripts are not scaling or yeah. why a simple solution to solve one problem would not scale to be an enterprise application. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so what you're kind of touching upon there, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, um, and we'll get into the, the idea of data discovery, but you're, are you saying you're getting companies coming to you because of they're looking at data to, for efficiency purposes as well as security? Is that what you're getting at? Yes, uh, and we've also what we've also seen, everyone kind of thought this data masking was a simple exercise. They thought yeah. it was databases. We know the databases. We know the application. Let's go ahead and write some scripts, right? Individually focused, out of context, any application or protecting that application's data is pretty straightforward, right? Like anybody can write a script and replace social security numbers. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. But very, very rarely in these large-scale enterprises do we have these island-type systems, right? Um, so if you touch data in one non-production database and you have corresponding data on another non-production database, now you've just increased your complexity because now you somehow have to replicate the same masking logic yeah. into another system. Now let's increase that uh, complexity a little bit more. What if the other system is not Oracle? What if the first system is Oracle, second system is SQL Server? Now that is another problem. Third, what if application B uh, is a vendor for our uh, application and you are not permitted to make copies of that application. So you only have production. So then now what happens is if application A, which you thought was simple and you can write some scripts to anonymize the data, but you have to make some connections to a production system where you cannot do anonymization, what happens? So what, uh, what the world has kind of come, or where society from an IT standpoint has come into is, perceived as a very simple problem. They started going down a path and then quickly they realized that they have some complications or some complexities within their IT infrastructure or their application stacks that the simple solution would not work. Yeah. Then they have to scale it up or, and this is why I think a lot of the data masking projects kind of hit ground that, um, or they ran ashore or they ran into problems is because they couldn't really solve it for the entire enterprise. So you get pushback, right? Like you anonymize data in a specific way. Uh, and uh, these are all live examples that I'm gonna use. So a database has a million Joes, right? Now yeah. I've replaced all those million Joes with a million Patasaradis. My indexes in my non-production works entirely differently than it does in production. So from right. a performance yeah. standpoint, from a scaling standpoint, it doesn't match anymore. Yeah. I've got 70,000 different unique names, right? Now I've replaced it with just one unique name because I just put X's instead because that's all I thought was necessary. Now the testing, the quality of testing of your non-production systems has been significantly compromised because you don't have the same volume of demographics. You don't have the same distribution of data. Yeah. So then the quality team will start pushing back and saying, we don't like this anonymization. So then you take that application out of your anonymization matrix, right? So that goes and then now the whole cluster of applications that all are relying on your anonymization, they can be anonymous anymore because one application is not able to anonymize. So slowly, all of these brilliant plans, I've heard this from a CIO of a leading bank uh, in New Zealand. They started off with a great, great goal to anonymize all of their 120 prime applications, customer, uh, customer facing applications over a five year plan. But it proved to be so difficult that at the end of five years, they had one application anonymized and they had to call it a success because the other 119 applications, they could not anonymize because of various degrees of complexity. Yeah. So this is what we're seeing. So now the customers that come to us are highly sophisticated. They've gone down this path. They've gone down this five-year plan of trying to anonymize 120 applications. And along the way, they've had to compromise. They've had to compromise. They had to compromise and go live with something so compromised that doesn't match their original vision. Yeah. And now they're all heightened to the need for data masking. They've all heightened to the need of protecting these lower environments and the production systems, but they don't have a solution. So then once the political battles are all fought, they go out and look for a solution that can address all 120 in the same way. Yeah. And that's where Mentis gets to play. So from being way ahead of the market and talking to people that did not know what we wanted, now we are in the other end of the pendulum where people that talk to us are super smart. They yeah. are, they've done this before. They have tried it before. They failed for a variety of reasons, either on their own or with other vendor solutions. So by the time they come and talk to us, they're extraordinarily sophisticated in their needs for data masking. And that, that what um, 
keeps us going, right? Our conversations are not simple, rote, what yeah. do you do about uh, a table? It's more like I've got this specific use case where I'm trying to share information, uh, like this one use case that we just uh, got. They want anonymization to work, but they also use a lot of online services to compute uh, something as simple as what is the travel reimbursement calculation? Yeah. So yeah. when my when I'm anonymizing the address of a of a of a European Union citizen, I have to come up with valid addresses because the 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 application that they're interfacing with will only work off of valid addresses. It'll first check whether the address is valid or not. So I can't come up with a bogus address. I just can't change everybody to one King Street in, in, in London. I'd rather have to keep the, the zip code, the state and the county the same, uh, but also anonymize the addresses, address line one, address line two, into what is absolutely valid, what actually will work for that external service to authorize, and then also compute the what the reimbursement could be. Yeah, yeah. This organization is doing something very interesting. They have spotted some trends, right? If the reimbursement goes up, they notice some other aspects of the business are also growing at the same pace. So they see the reimbursement to be kind of a, an early indicator for, for some other business trends. So they need that, even in their non-production, to be accurate. Yeah. Not exact, the original realistic data, but that needed to be good enough for them to process all of these other trend analysis that they're doing. So what, what so, you're saying there, I mean, just to just to break it down a bit. So what you're saying there, for example, is if, if in sales, your sales people, their expenses are going up, that you would see a correlation uh, related to revenue as well, right? Exactly. They were absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we've been talking about, and you got into um, data masking, um, you touched on applications, and you also touched on GDPR. So some good talking points there. Um, to come back to that customer in New Zealand, what, what you're saying is that in that instance, that customer tried to um, uh, almost, let's say, um, what's the word? configure each application to mask the data, right? So the workload multiplied by 120 times. And your argument, and I think what a lot of people's argument is in data, is if you secure the data, the applications that are working with it are secured by proxy, right? Uh, either by proxy or through some other mechanisms. Um, yeah. Mintis does not rely on proxies. We have many ways of um, protecting and anonymizing the data um, because the first thing is, I think personally from, from experience of doing this for the last 16 years is um, any single approach to protecting data in these complex applications will never work. A simple one-way solution will never scale because of the 120 applications, one of them was built by a team of developers in New Zealand. 10 of them were built by a team of developers in Japan. Yeah. 20 of them were built in the United States and 15 of them were built in Israel. And some of them are Oracle, some of them are MySQL, some of them are DB2, some of them are IMS. Different coding methodologies, give different languages, different mindsets, different time, different uh, years. And, and none of these applications are similar to any other, right? Each of them are unique and complex in, in their own way. Yeah. And introducing a simple solution and say, and this is why I think my co-vendors have done a really bad disservice by saying, oh, this can be solved simply. There is no no such thing as solving something simply for uh, data masking yeah. for these device applications. Yeah. So our uh, what we what we did early on is we start we started spotting these trends because I've been I've been doing this for sixteen years. I've been seeing how every application, even within a single customer, is different from one another. Right? Like if we take one approach for one application, there is no guarantee to work on another application. So let's take a customer that has Oracle e business suite and PeopleSoft. You can't protect them the same way. They might both be running on uh, Oracle. They might both be owned by Oracle Corporation IP-wise, but the protections can be exactly the same. They have to be slightly tuned for each of them. Yeah. Then if you go to something that was built 60 years ago on a mainframe, you can't take this logic and apply it there. It'll never work. So a proxy solution always has a weakness. A proxy, like if you take an Oracle database and you make a proxy-based solution, right? Any Enterprise DBA, worth this or her salt, will never go through the proxy. They will go directly to the server, they'll putty into it, yeah. and they can look at the data right there. Yeah. So yeah. if you're starting with protecting the data from an internal threat, which would also mean that you can protect it from an external threat, 
then this is a big loophole. So what we did was proxy only when an embedded solution is not possible. So wherever possible, we embed our technology into the data store itself and protect that so that there is no circumvention. There's no way a DBA or a developer can get around it. And also, it also helps significantly from any of the data residency laws that are being passed. Uh, we have a customer in Switzerland. They are, for the first time in history, they're able to get their data to be outsourced to India. Right. Because our, our masking is embedded into the data store, which is physically located in Switzerland. So even a logical access from India will never see the sensor data because it will not leave physically or logically will not leave the database. So, so, that, we've got yeah. so in that instance, then, to your point, because, you know, things like GDPR are tackling the, the travel, the transfer of data to non-EU entities and indeed within EU entities. And what you're saying is, is that by by controlling, by masking production and information, if you have developers in an outsourced country who never see that data, you kind of circumnavigate these regulations, right? Because those people are never going to see a person's address or, a, you know, God forbid, a credit card number. Is that is that what you're getting at? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So um, nearshoring, offshoring, outsourcing, I think it's becoming normal, right? Like we yeah. are in a much more connected world Technology and bandwidth has made it possible for somebody sitting like 7,000 miles away to be able to operate just as they are sitting with you. But that also means that just because you're physically, so even within Europe, even within the shores of Europe, you cannot have somebody that sits in Germany uh, and their access, their, their data be accessed by somebody in Poland. Yeah. So we, because of data secrecy requirements and data residency requirements, we have to make sure we follow the location of the person that is requesting the data access. And we have to do some conditional masking based on the location of the end user. So that if the access is coming from Poland, we, I can show them data from Poland, I can show them the access data from Spain, but I cannot show them data from Switzerland or Germany. And I cannot show them access to data, that, data from Singapore. So, and then Singapore, you can sit in Singapore, if you have a global organization and you have people all over, the customers or employees all over, if you have data requests from Singapore and your data is hosted in, let's say, the United States, you cannot show them any U.S. data, but you can show them Singapore data. Yeah. yeah. So this this becomes really complex, and there is the and what my concern is using a proxy-based solution means the data already leaves the data store before it's transformed or anything is happening. Yeah. yeah. So that will that will not pass any. A Swiss legal forum or any logical access review on where the data is and whether data residency is being applied or not. Yeah, yeah. So we've had what GDPR. We've had it now for what about a year? Uh, is it a year? About yeah, a year, May twenty fifth of yeah. two thousand eighteen. So it's yeah. just a year plus. Yeah. Okay. And we've got um, the CCPA coming up, the California Act um, for U.S. organizations. What are you seeing there? Are are people prepared for what's coming in California? And I think, you know, there'll be other states and probably something federal that follows. Um, are, are people, uh, from what you've seen, are people ready for what's coming in January? So typically, and Lewis, I think we have seen this together, uh, survey largely hit in uh, 2004. Yeah. And it took many years before customers actually did something about it. They spent the first few years of the legislation trying to understand what is the scope of what they should be doing. Uh, and typically it takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months before people start actually doing the, the solutioning or the enforcement of um, doing what it takes to protect the data or what the intent of the application is. I'm seeing something similar happen with GDPR. It's early days, PST, people are still answering questionnaires and they're still doing uh, simple question answer type uh, solutions. They've actually not gone into understanding, uh, laying out the entire architecture framework and saying, okay, now we need to actually solve this problem. Yeah. That is coming though. In the next, uh, I think a lot of analysts are also saying the same thing. In the next six months or so, you'll actually see an adoption of technologies to actually comply with the spirit of what GDPR intended. Yeah. So if you take that same exact template and you apply it to CCPA, we're again another two years away from actually people doing something. Uh, they will, start, whether we like this or not, legislation goes into effect in January of 2019 a lot of customers will ask, start, start asking the questions in March. Yeah. Once there's a first fine, people will wake up, start asking a lot of questions. The really sharp organization that are ahead of the curve would probably be doing something because they might have uh, impact of GDPR anyway. Yeah. Um, 
but they they will start doing something and it's, um, in spirit ccp and gdpr are all trying to do the same thing so as um, the actual impact especially for an organization like mine that provides the enforcement technology it will take two years before the legislation actually has a positive impact on our our bottom line yeah okay um so we have regulation um i uh i was working with our company to do gdpr and uh you know, we had to we had to kind of go through um, CRM and figure out where the data was, and I guess that leads me on to something which I think you you guys have talked about quite a lot. And I was I was reading a paper of yours about dark data, uh-huh. and I think really what it comes down to is is would you agree that kind of the first step, you know, what once you're going through the process of getting in line with this regulation, is you you really need to start thinking about data discovery. And that's something that you yeah. guys have talked about a lot. So that, that's, a, that's a brilliant segue. Um, so what we are seeing as a trend is the older the system, the more likely that the customer does not know where their sensitive data is yeah. because of a variety of understandable and logical reasons that they would have had developers work on it from different times, different places, and the, the developers might not be around. The application owners might not be around. So, the, so a lot of things might not have gotten documented. Applications that were engineered before this advent of these new legislation and the awareness of privacy and all of that, those all will have, they won't have proper massive data management. They will have sensitive data being redundant in multiple places. The newer applications, like if an organization has started a new big data platform or a data lake uh, in the last couple of years, I'm sure they're mindful of all these uh, compliance laws and they've actually started documenting where the sensitive data is. Yeah. But when you look at any legacy application or any unstructured data or SharePoint or file systems, they all have all, all forms of sensitive data in undocumented places. What we typically find is, um, Bob, I'll give you some real examples. We have a customer that had been doing an incredible job on protecting their people's software environment. And they, had, they, they, they were some of the sharpest people that I'd met and they were, they would written their own scripts to anonymize people's soft data and things like that, but they wanted it to become more of an enterprise solution. They want they had multiple applications that they wanted to anonymize the same way, yeah. and they didn't have the time to extend their logic to these different applications. They started talking to us. So the first time, so these guys have been doing this for about nine or ten years, so they really knew where the data was. So my first challenge to them is, do you really know where all of your sensitive data is? And they said, yes, we've got our sensitive data in these places. If there's 236 columns where we have national identifier. This is the PeopleSoft system. There's a lot of redundancy, redundancy in data. Yeah. And we found it in 293 columns. Because somebody like 15 years ago had built this procedure that was, that was creating a composite column that was taking first name, piping it with the national identifier and piping that with the date of birth to create a unique uh, field. And then they were using that to map to other tables and things like that. None of this was documented. So until you start discovering this data, you will find what we call dark data. If the column is called national identifier, I get no money for discovering that because anybody can. But if the column is called value, like a key value pair or these composite columns or embedded data or somebody creating a backup table and not documenting it, we typically find about 80% of an organization's data in these hard to find locations. Yeah. And when these dark data is actually used in, um, in some application logic, right? So it said you have some application logic that says a new column that we did not know about uh, where you have social security number in certain cases, like a key value pair, and that has to match some other data on some other table and the process relies on it. If you don't discover this uh, dark data column and table, your data masking project will fail again. Yeah. So it is important. Some of them we can eliminate, right? Like risk elimination is the holy grail. If you can eliminate risk, fantastic, we can all go home. So when I, of the 293 columns that we found, it was obvious about 18 of them or 17 of them could actually be truncated on the table slot because there was no impact anywhere to the application. Okay. But the others that we documented that they were not aware of absolutely had to be addressed. Yeah. So the two things, one, you can eliminate risk by running some form of a discovery that will, a sophisticated discovery that will find all of your locations. But then the second one is also you ensure that your applications don't fail doing any testing of a downstream system. Because if you changed your national identifier original location, but another column is called value somewhere, you didn't touch it. 
then you might have in data inconsistencies later on when you're scrambling the data or when you're processing the data. Yeah. So you so you would say then, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of sim- try and simplify what you just said. Um, over time, developers might, you know, customize or build upon the database, say they want a, a way of quickly capturing um, social security numbers. And they'll build a column in a table, maybe a custom page in an application to, to display. It's not documented anywhere. And what you're really saying is that this is dark data. It's undocumented. It's unknown, except to that person or a, a couple of people potentially. And that person might leave. And here we are five years later wondering, you know, what, what is our data? Where is it? We know the generic column in the app or the database for the social security number but where else has it been copied to right where else is that being worked on that that's really what you're saying when you think about dark data would you agree with that exactly right and there are also instances of um, so some of the dark data is still in use right it's created for a a process or an application and it's still being used and that we can kind of find out somewhat um, in a few ways because if you don't change it some process will fail, then you're forced to examine your code and figure out there's a column where you did not, you're not aware of. But what you don't find is um, we have a customer that was uh, starting a new process of integrating with American Express credit card statements, right? So American Express was gonna send for all employees, they're gonna send these flat files of transactions for the past, for the past month. Okay. And this customer built an interface that will extract that data and put it into an expense report um, interface tables and then it will get um, imported in. So to test this process, we have a developer uh, that created a table called Mex underscore kitchen. So she took a small volume of transactions that were all from a local restaurant called Mexican kitchen. And this was all imported. And the table the table was called Mex underscore kitchen and the columns are called TX1 to TX32 because there were 32 delimited fields. Right. And uh, she created this table, she tested all of it, and then finally she fixed her procedure to not go into the TX table or on the next kitchen table, but the actual actual table, and then it goes into the staging table, it goes into the uh, Oracle interface table, and gets imported. Okay. And they tested it, and then they went, what they did was they were going from uh, 11i to 12, R12, and they did all of this work, and then they converted their environment uh, into production. They converted gold into product. Fine. And then three years later, we find that there's this table with about 4,000 rows of data with everybody's name, address, social security number, credit card number, expiration date, every piece of information necessary. Yeah. Clear. Ready, ready to this. Ready okay. And easy to write, like, in a, in a properly usable format that anybody that needed that data could misuse. Yeah. Have you have so, you have you worked with customers where that's happened, where some, something like that has been done for the sole purpose of misuse? Have you seen uh, that? It's okay we if you haven't, haven't identified anything like that. We've yeah. kind of been ahead of the curve, yeah. um, but we have had um, we have found. So one of the things we all we do is we also scan uh, code, right? Like we look at. Uh, uh, we not only understand where the data is by looking at the data, we also we also scan the code wherever it is available to understand how data is moving across the systems. Yeah. Sometimes we've seen some procedures that have been written that copies data for a temporary purpose into certain areas. And we, we do not know what the purpose was. There's no documented business reason. Yeah. And obviously nobody's uh, fessing up to it. So we've seen code that were like almost orphans, but they were touching sensitive data with no, with no known purpose. So those we have eliminated, we have highlighted that, but we couldn't necessarily trace it back to malicious intent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, um, I, you know, th- there's always two elements to all of this. There's technology and then there's, you know, people and, and with people, obviously, process. So um, when, you're, when you've been working with customers um, and, you know, it comes to light that, you know, these tables have been created, these data stores have been created... Is that, that how, you know, how does that kind of go down with management? Are they kind of shocked and surprised that all of this work was done? It wasn't documented. Um, I imagine, I imagine that people would look at that as sort of some kind of big screw up, right? That, you know, developers playing around in systems and especially playing with sensitive data like that. Yeah, I think everybody is kind of shocked, but um, the shock is more on the extent of it. 
they kind of expect that there's got to be some parts of whatever they've done over the years that's not been properly documented because the, the, there was no reason to do it, right? Like most of us are working towards uh, deadlines and timelines and trying to get the work done as quick as possible. We don't really take the time to go back and document what we did yeah, um, because of the time pressures we all work under. But I think the extent of how much it's not been documented is what is surprising the most people. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to, um, you know, we've talked about data discovery, okay, and then we, you, you've got on to sort of like the end result is that you need to think about um, masking your data. Um, do you think, and, and uh, I know obviously you're a, you know, you build the software, you sell the software, but as a principle, do you think that by masking data, the vast majority of modern breaches would ne- would never happen, or they might happen, but the data would be useless. Would you would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I would agree with that statement, and I think uh, we are still not completely aware of the volume of uh, data access that's going on. Right, that is yeah. inappropriate, uh, not correct. So if you can actually document all that inappropriate access, like a developer looking at a production database, running a query against his peer salary. All of that is actually a compliance law, but we don't we don't see that because we are not really looking at data access that way. We are still battling with the firewall problem, right? Like we're yeah. still thinking about DMZs. We're still thinking about keeping the outside in, whereas it's been it's clearly proven that the the threat is already inside. So we just need to document it better. But all the ones that are even documented, I think, where data masking is in place, and if you build out your data masking routine appropriately, yeah. it would. There is a little bit of a psychological element in the way Mentis does data masking is we will provide really good data. It won't be correct. It will be completely useless for a data theft. Yeah. But psychologically, if uh, if let's say Rajesh goes into an organization and can run a query against a known set of tables, that I know where the sensitive data is. And I run a query and I want to extract it and go away and I want to use it for some nefarious purposes. If you show me access and wise, I know for sure you've done some anonymization. So then I will start digging around trying to break it. Yeah. Instead, I'll provide some really good information that looks fantastic, that works for all. It passes the sniff test. I export the data, go out, and then I try to do some, I try to get a new credit card with it. It will fail because the person is not real. So that's also some psychological thing where if you do an anonymization, but we do it in a in a way that looks real, but it's not real you can avoid a lot of the problems uh, in today's market and yeah. how data is being reached. Yeah. Let them yeah. something that's, that looks good, but it's not real. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you saw it, um, I think over the last couple of days, somebody at Facebook had their car broken into and a laptop was taken and it had payroll and in, in personal information for employees on it. And you sort of think, well, you know, what was the business purpose of somebody having that? Um, why did they need that data and... and would it have still been as useful to them if the real important information had been masked? That's that's the key problem, right? It's been able to join information together. A name is only so good, but it's great when you have an address. It's even better when you have a credit card number and the expiry and all the rest of it, right? That as you start to yeah. join information together, it becomes much more useful. Yeah, in the topic of uh, privacy... Um, there is something called the uh, K-anonymity. Um, if I were to explain that a little bit uh, in a way that makes sense to me. Yeah. Every person has some defining attributes. Uh, some of those attributes are make you very unique. Uh, but a lot of attributes don't make you unique individually. Like, for example, if I say a um, person has black hair uh, and is uh, balding, uh, lives in uh, New York City um, and is uh, 47 years old, none of these individually will give you a person. Yeah. Collectively, together, you'll end up with, like, say, 10,000 people. Still not unique. But if you start adding some more, if you say he's Indian, now you reduce that to about 200 people. Yeah. And then you say he's vegetarian. Now, none of these, none of these attributes actually directly identify a person. But if you can combine all of these attributes, these are called quasi-attributes, right? Like if you say directly identifying would be name, address, social security number, and, and things like that. And then these other quasi-attributes that all together, you add more and more pieces of it, you collect it together. Now you can basically say this is Rajesh that lives in New York, right? So what we, uh, how we approach all of that is 
take each of them based on their character of uniqueness, anonymize it the best you can. Yeah. Uh, so if it is a unique social security number, anonymize it with AES uh, format preserving encryption so that it's irreversible. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Dark, if I have black hair, you don't need to do that much. If you just change it blonde and you're completely broken any way of getting back to me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so we, that's why we take data classification based approach. We identify all of these direct identifiers and the quasi identifiers, and then we document them and then say, you know what, the best way to provide privacy or protection or, or security is anonymize each of them individually without regard to any other context. Yeah. So then there is a risk of reversibility of uh, anonymization that's already always talked about. The way we address it, each data classification that we anonymize it reduces the risk of re-identification significantly. So if you change Rajesh, so if I, let's say there are 12 attributes together, 12 quasi attributes that can identify me, if you just change my hair color, done, you've broken the whole chain. Yeah. Right, then you change my data, but wait a few days, there's no way to get, get it back. So that's, that's our objective is to identify, that's part of the discovery's job also, is to identify all of these director and quasi attributes, and then also recommend Based on the, your data set, I know that if you just change these data, data elements, your risk of reversibility goes down and down and down. So it's almost irreversible to get the original person. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, we're talking about um, um, anonymization, masking, that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to talk about something which has, to me, has always been an objection when talking to organizations, which is performance. The fear that you know, by by um, playing with or or uh, changing data, as it were, that there's going to be a performance impact. Certainly, when you look at you know putting in data security configuration in apps, they do introduce uh, performance impacts, right? Your uh, uh, for the listeners is row security, data security, that kind of thing. Um, do you get do you get that as an objection? People are like, well, we you know we 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 have to balance like security and performance. Uh, we want the app to perform well. We don't want to stop people doing their jobs or slow them down by waiting for the app to figure out what data I should be seeing. Um, is, is that a challenge you see? Is that something that you've overcome with um, with what you've been doing over the last few years? Yeah, always. That's actually the, you put it in the best possible way there. Um, so. Anytime we go through a discussion with a customer, you've got different parties in the mix. You've got the application owners, you've got the deviation developers, you've got the security team. Each of them wants something different from this process, right? Sometimes security will want like absolute security that there's, they don't care about performance impact. Whereas your developers and DBAs, they want to just be able to do their job without any impediments and making things slower. Application owners just don't want to hear about this, right? They just want to be able to make progress and they want other people to figure out performance versus uh, security uh, conundrum. Yeah. So how we approach this is, if it's static data masking, if you're changing the data in your lower environments, there is no impact. There's no, it's a one-time operation, it's done. It doesn't change anything. There's no performance impact, ongoing performance impact. We'll keep the data lens and everything exactly the same. So you will see no performance impact whatsoever. Yeah. When it becomes dynamic data masking, where the masking happens at runtime based on a set of rules and conditions that are being passed, there is, uh, it's obvious that there will be a performance impact. There is uh, surely, because there's some transformation, there's some analysis, there's something happening at runtime. So what we've done, as much as possible, we try to make that decision when the connection to the data database is made. Um, so, Lewis logs into the database. At that point of time, it will check Lewis. Is there a rule to mask data for Lewis? Yes or no? If you are, if you are supposed to get masked data, we automatically change you into a mask to set up so that you will never see sensitive data anywhere else. So that determination happens at one, at the beginning. Then subsequently, we've also optimized our processes so much. We use like uh, special indexes and things like that to make sure that none of your queries actually limit uh, or have a performance impact on how we are querying the data. Yeah. So there are many, many mechanisms. So for most of them, big data, for example, is always a challenge, right? Because you're looking at really large volumes of data, like billions of rows, and you've got the runner query that groups by, order by, does all of this stuff. And if you're doing an anonymization for each session, for each query, 
it becomes difficult. So those types of cases, what we do is we pre-realize the anonymization, uh, and then we just only at runtime we just do a one-to-one -one swap, uh, and that also minimizes the performance impact. Yeah, we see okay. anywhere from four to twelve percent performance impact on large big data queries on Oracle SQL Server and all that. It's almost imperceptible because of the use of the ability to use indexes within the within the environment. Yeah. Okay. And we got into some um, some deep dive stuff there um, on, on databases. I want to kind of bring it back up. Um, I'm let's say I'm uh, I'm I'm starting with a a, a new employer. I'm a project manager, and uh, I've been tasked with getting us ready or compliant with GDPR or CCPA. Um, from your perspective, where should I start? What would be key points that you see in success? And let, let's do that in the context of data discovery, um, uh, in you know, the masking and controlling of data, and then also um, retiring data and things like the right to be forgotten, which we haven't touched on too much. So with though, could you give us like a, a good walkthrough of what a successful project looks like in terms of getting A, a handle on security, and B, getting some good policies and controls around it? Yes. Um, so like you said, data discovery is the beginning. It's the first step. Um, and we have the necessary data classifications to get going on that project immediately. So we drop our application, you start with running data discovery on your key systems that has customer identifying data. Start with that, you document that. The next step, which is not something that anybody does at the moment, is to look at the data retirement, right? Simple use case. You have an employee that left the organization three years ago. There is no real reason for you to keep that employee's data in your life systems, only because you're carrying the risk. If they come to you for a right to be forgotten, yes, at that point of time, you can delete that data or you can anonymize the data. But if you just do this ahead of time, follow what your data retention policies are. If some of the data needs to be kept up to uh, uh, audit requirements, maybe eight years. Some of them, like the old um, data privacy directive, you needed to keep it for five years. Yep. But you don't have to keep employees' data that is they've left the organization 10 years back. If there's no rehire possibility. Just go ahead and delete that data. I think that is another low hanging fruit that organizations will start right away. Yeah. Um, so these are, this is the starting point, I think. The discovery is first, and then retirement or the deletion of sensitive data that's not necessary for day to day operations. That needs to happen. The, the difference between retirement and deletion is. Retirement just organizes the data and takes it out of the system so you can reverse it at any point of time. Uh, in case there is a legal need to produce or something like that, you can reverse it, whereas deletion will completely be eliminated from your system. So you, those are the two options there. You yeah. can do one or the other. Yeah. And then afterwards, what you need to do is look at who has access to sensitive data. Where do they have access to the data? And take a, take a sharp knife and then trim out anyone that does not have a need. You eliminate their access either through some form of intrusion prevention or through some masking rules and you deploy them so that you restrict the amount of people that have access to sensitive data and then you monitor everything else. You make a list of who's looking at sensitive data at what point of time and you go about asking questions around why are you looking at this data at this point in time. You make, an, <coughs> make some uh, better choices on who's looking at sensitive data. Yeah. But what should not be forgotten in all of this, the old what's not sexy anymore because people talked about it a long time back <clears throat> is absolute change control. Okay. Any new table or column or procedure or code or page or report that's being introduced, <coughs> excuse me, into production has to be reviewed now with the lens of GDPR and CCPA. Yeah. Things should not go to production quite easily anymore. They have to be reviewed so that, if, let's say we do all this fun stuff. We do, do the discovery, we create data masking rules. And suddenly somebody writes a new procedure, creates a new table and copies sensitive data out. The only way we'll find this during our next discovery, <coughs> or we have proper change management and we capture this change, we are aware of this change before it hits production. That's how you stay ahead of the game here. Uh, yeah. with the flags. Okay. Okay. All right. So some good advice there. Um, okay. I uh, let, Let's bring it back to... Um, 
something of a more personal level, we've talked a lot about um, data, data masking, data discovery, and so on. Um, I want to talk about your role with Forbes. Um, and it was interesting because I, I saw you put this up on um, LinkedIn that you joined the Forbes Council. Can you um, can you talk to that and what, what that's all about? So the, the Forbes uh, group, they have um, certain councils. Um, one is a coaches council where all the coaches get together and help other people. Uh, another one is the technology council, which I've been invited to be a part of. Yeah. This is uh, basically people that are in technology that are doing something creative and uh, and are also influencing the direction of business. So th- with this, I get access to other CIOs and thought leaders that are all moving moving the chain on how things are operating, as well as be able to share my thought leadership through a series of articles and uh, share my knowledge with uh, with a growing audience of people that read anything that's published on Forbes. Okay. Um, so they invited me. I've joined them. They also have events every um, every quarter. They have events in New York and other geographies to bring uh, business leaders together. So it is um, this, the simplest way to look at it as a networking event of people that are influencing technology, but it's way more than that. It yeah. is the ability to influence everybody's thought as well as uh, help shepherd change in, in organizations and in societies as a group. Okay. So while we're on the subject of thought leadership, um, any thoughts on the role of AI, machine learning, the current buzzwords, in um, in data security? Yeah, very recently I got off a webinar where I talked about responsible use of sensitive data for uh, analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. We, have, we live in a very different world now, right? We can get excited about all the opportunities that AI and machine learning and analytics can provide to us and these deep cutting insights that these applications can provide. But we always have to keep in mind, we still have the responsibility to protect an individual's privacy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever AI we are using, whatever machine learning you're doing, whatever analytics that you're gathering, we first have to make sure it does not at any point of time expose sensitive information of an individual. We've got that responsibility to do. Then on the other side of it, we are deploying AI and machine learning in many ways uh, for our discovery to get better, for our discovery to analyze different data patterns and understand how sensitive data is interconnected to different things. Uh, Especially in unstructured data, there's almost no chance for us to run any data classification without proper artificial intelligence. So if I'm looking at a database and I find something that looks like a social security number, it is generally with a lot of other data, so I can kind of validate it. I can look at the column name. I can see if the data matches to other tables. I can do all of that in the relational database. But if it's a PDF file or if it's a Word document, and it's got one name and one social security number, I don't have the same liberties that I have in structured or large volume databases. So there we have to rely on things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to do a much better job and increase our, uh, <clears throat> increase our efficiency of our scans and discovery while eliminating false positives as well. Yeah, okay, okay. Excellent. Well, um, you know, we, we're drawing up to an hour and um, I appreciate you're a busy man. Um, without uh, ironically giving away too much personal information, how can people get hold of you um, and, uh, and or Mentis? What's the best way to, to, to reach you? The, the best way to reach me uh, is uh, LinkedIn. I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn. So if you just search for Mentis CEO, um, my, that's my handle. Okay. Uh, you, you should be able to find me. And the Mentis website is mentisinc.com. Yeah, uh, you can reach, reach me that way also. Okay, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't get onto secure facts, but I did sign up for that. Do, could you just give us a brief in, um, explanation of your secure facts newsletter? Let's see if we can... Yeah, what we had uh, about a uh, year uh, year plus ago, I was always looking at uh, the different data stories, uh, security information that's happening, breaches across the globe. How are people uh, addressing it? And I used to start collecting it to just share it with uh, Mentis and share it with uh, people that are in my product management group and my development group. So they are aware of what's happening uh, in the world. That then said, it was, there were so many that was posting that was was blocking our WhatsApp group from getting any activity done. So we created a separate WhatsApp group, just internal, to share all of these um, items. We call them secure facts of things that are happening around the globe. 
then someone suggested, but why do we have to keep this internal? Why don't we just start making a newsletter and sending it out to the world? Because you're just collecting a lot of this information. We just yeah. do it weekly. Yeah. So that was the germination of it. So it has been going on now for at least many, many weeks now. And it is uh, very useful. It will tell you, there, there might be like 100 stories a week, but we will just highlight the top five or top 10 of okay. really impactful stories that happened in the past week. It could be something as <clears throat> a new vulnerability has been found in the Nest, uh, uh, Nest cameras, or it could be something like Android malware is uh, making the rounds, or it could be something like an Oracle database vulnerability. Yeah, it yeah. could be a whole spectrum of things that we think are interesting for people to be aware of. So if you have the if you have the ability, to, you should just follow it. It it should it should be like a one minute read each week. Yeah, it'd be well worth your time. Okay. Well, Rajesh, again, thank you very much. Um, I've I've known you um, through meeting you at conferences and things since 2009. Always a pleasure talking with you, and I do appreciate um, you taking the time to talk with me this morning. Yeah, likewise, it's always a pleasure, Lewis, and appreciate the opportunity to have my thoughts.